All righty. Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome to this week's Inspection 360 uh, by, from Evident Scientific. Uh, I have actually get the chance to uh, sort of co-host this presentation today with our with our friends at, at, at Geotech. So uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Michael Hall. I'm one of the X-ray specialists at uh, Evident Scientific here in the Americas, um, and uh, our um, presenter today is uh, James Shreve from Geotech. Uh, James and I have had the privilege of working together for uh, a number of years, although most of our encounters are like this, uh, uh, sort of virtual and across technology, uh, as James flies around the world but is is sort of calls the UK home and I'm, I'm here in the United States. Um, so uh, just to orient you today, uh, uh, James is going to give some lives demonstration and uh, also present a couple case studies from using PXRF in oil and gas reservoirs, which will be a great, great presentation. We are gonna, you are, you can ask questions at any time. So uh, you should see on your dashboard, uh, a section for questions. If you put in questions there, I'll be monitoring those. Uh, I may answer some in the chat along the way, but we're gonna have a big section of time uh, at the end for uh, discussion and Q&A. But feel free to go ahead and put those questions in uh, real time as they come to mind, and we'll make sure we get them all answered before the webinar is over. There will be a recording of this webinar available, and we'll send out a link to all the registries uh, afterwards, so you can share that with your colleagues, or if you want to go back and, and focus in on a point um, afterwards. So let me again, let me introduce uh, my colleague James uh, Shreve to you. James is a geologist, uh, and he has uh, worked as a professional geologist and consulting, but has now been at Geotech uh, for a number of years as a geoscientist and uh, and uh, the sales director there now. And so he'll just gonna show their technology. We've been working with Geotech for probably more than a decade with it on, on the side of Evident Scientific, we make uh, X-ray fluorescence analyzers and uh, Geotech brings their uh, geological expertise as well as uh, their mechanical design expertise for these um, moving bed core scanners, um, which are really quite um, elegant systems. And I think James is gonna present today. So with that, James, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Michael, and good morning, good afternoon, uh, good midday, wherever you are in the world. Um, thanks very much for taking your time to see us all here in our laboratory uh, at Geotech Limited. So I've got a setup here uh, for you today to uh, show you what's behind me, the multi-sensor core logger, where you can see the Olympus or the Evident Vanta uh, attached onto the, uh, onto the rig behind me. I've got some oil and gas core from the Brave field, which we're going to do some scanning on during the demonstration. And I'm going to intermingle some slides uh, throughout this talk as well. Uh, so looking forward to getting, getting going, and uh, let's hope this all goes together. So first and foremost, I want to give you an introduction to why this is all important. So I'm going to share my screen first um, and uh, showcase to you all uh, how this all starts. So we're going to be talking a little bit about XRF core scanning and what we do with Geotech and how we integrate that onto our multi-sensor core loggers here in this talk. So we're going to do why use these systems first. We're going to crack on with a live demonstration of the MSCLS behind me. And then we're going to talk about some case studies from the UKCS uh, in the North Sea and also from a pre-salt reservoirs in Brazil, where we've recently completed a multi-client project. And then, of course, we've got some questions on the other end of how to look how, uh, for the audience. So the first part of what we do, what's the role of core scanners? And, and, and I want to broaden this out first because we're talking a lot about XRF in this webinar. But in truth, we have to ask the question is, why should we automate this? Why should I put my perfectly good Olympus or Evident Vanta or portable XRF onto an automated system? And the first thing I'd like to say with that is the core samples that we analyze here are the tangible proof of the subsurface. I think we all agree with that. This tangible proof, as in the proof of what exists in the subsurface, is probably one of the most expensive things to acquire in any geological project. It doesn't matter if it's offshore for oil and gas, onshore for mining, or it's core samples for a new bridge or foundations for the oil and gas reservoir. It doesn't 
matter which application it is, it typically is the most expensive. And of course, what we do with that sample is we typically break it. We measure its strength by crushing it or by snapping it in two, or we dissolve it to look at its chemistry or mineralogy, or we put careful um, succulents through it to extract some of those fluids that damage that rock material. So we're actually doing destructive testing on something that is very valuable and very expensive. And that's where portable XRF really comes in play. And also where core scanners come in play. It's also fair to say that these rocks, these precious materials often sit languishing and trapped on shelves in a core repository. And you can see some examples on this slide of core repositories around the world. And it's fair to say that when these very important materials are sitting in a repository like you can see here, they are a pretty underutilized resource of information. And this is where the automation of sensors like the portable XRF is so important, because we can use them in, in a defined and automated manner to rescue data that's trapped within that rock material and turn what is ultimately an underutilized resource of information that's stuck on shelves into a utilized resource of information. And both of my case studies here today are gonna to be talking to you about how we've done exactly this. So just to prove that point a little bit, I'm gonna show you a couple of slides of where this value really becomes important. Now, this is a, a picture of an oil and gas uh, reservoir. This is from the Dunlin field in the UKCS. This is a picture of the original core photograph that was taken in 1985. And you can see that this has got a pretty normal plugging point part. So every foot they've taken a core plug. So we have three points per one meter of core. With core scanning data, well, first we can take a really nice picture of it, which is true. We've got you know, the best part of 30 years worth of improvement in cameras. But then each of these stars can represent an individual portable XRF point or an individual that's tied to a density measurement, to a natural gamma measurement, to a mineralogy measurement. Now, if I did a measurement every 10 centimeters, I'd have three times the amount of data than I would normally have per one meter of core using a traditional method. So I'm increasing the data density that exists. The same is true for this next example. Here's a bit more of the mud-rich fasces um, that we see here. We've got a new picture, nice high resolution, lots of new chemistry data points we can extract from the core. We can tie that to an X-ray radiograph and finally to mineralogy, where the final map allows you to link these chemistry points to the volume percent of clay. And what you're looking at here is a hyperspectral image a volume percent clay within the reservoir. So what we're doing is we're creating a digital record that can be viewed in detail that just wasn't possible when this core was originally drilled. Now I tell you that I picked these cores up from when the Fairfield was decommissioning the field from the Dunlin and these cores sat there on boxes not doing anything. And now I've ex we've done by using multi-sensor core loggers We've extracted a modern day, a modern data set from this stratigraphy, and we can start answering some new questions about what we might have missed, and we'll cover this later on. Now, there's another benefit to what we do here by creating value, by automating measurements like the portable X-ray behind us. And the first one is a question that I'd all like the audience to think about here. If you look at the photograph that you can see, the question is, how would you describe this core? It's true to say that most geologists would come up with similar descriptions, but they would all probably be slightly different. In fact, it's very likely to be slightly different. The colors might be different. People see different, different things. Of course, your own tendencies as geologists like to pick out features that you're interested in. For me, it's ignofascies. Others, it might be mass movement deposits or whichever type of sedimentological feature in this particular example you might be interested in. The detail might be different. An engineer versus a geologist would describe different things. And so what you end up with is a subjective description of the core. When we use automated systems like the MSCL behind me, they don't know that scanning core. 
in reality, it's just taking the same, it's doing the same measurement every single time. And it's present, we present the core sample to it. The result is a consistent, unsubjective and depth co-registered data set that can be then used in a way that can be quantified in what we see. And this consistent, high data density data set collected from underutilized material, i.e. the core samples sitting on shelves, is the very foundation from which data science can be created in the future. And this is where we're talking about and what the value of what we do here at Geotech. We are collecting consistent data set using a range of different parameters of which the evident banter is one of them to answer questions about the reservoir in this particular case, maybe the seal or the, um, if we're talking about CCUS and really rescuing data that has otherwise never been measured previously. So when I go through the live demonstration, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about the sensor technology, how we utilize it and showcase this to you all. And in the back of your minds, I'd like you just to think about these value propositions of, as we go through. Okay, so the next part is the live demonstration. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, I'm gonna come back live, and we're gonna be flicking between a couple of different cameras whilst I do this. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see me right about now, which is absolutely grand. So behind me, we have a multi-sensor core logger. I'm just gonna move over and just start the system running again. So what's happening behind me now is we have a range of different sensors like you can see behind. They are in an automated fashion collecting data in a simultaneous way. What does that mean? It means that the XRF, which is firing now behind me, is measuring at the same time as the magnetic susceptibility, the density in the natural gamma. In other words, we have a continuous stream of data. Once those measurements are finished, you'll see the core that move, will move up behind me in this case, an interval of two centimeters. So these instruments operate in the same way whereby core is loaded on the right-hand side of the track, is then pushed past the sensors behind me and is received on the other end of the track. And we'll have a look at that in a minute. The measurements that we can do on this system are varied. You as the user can choose how many measurements you want to take per meter. You can choose how long you may wish the dwell times on the XRF to be. In this particular case, I'm using quite count, fast count times just for the purposes of this demonstration. Everything that you see behind me is then collected live and displayed on the computer. And those data sets can then be processed into density and grounds per CC. They can be pulled into natural gamma, KUTH, or API functions as necessary and exported as a CSV file. All the data that you have there is in a non-proprietary format and depth co-registered with each other. And what I mean by depth co-registration is that at the same depth as the XRF is the density point. At the same depth as the XRF and the density is the magnetic susceptibility, the P wave velocity and the natural gamma. This way, when you export it, you have depth in one column with your parameters across on the Y axis, if you can imagine that in the process. Okay, what I'd like to do now is to showcase this a little to you. So we're gonna switch over to my roaming camera here and we're gonna have a look at the system. Okay, so what we have here at this particular point, as you can see, is a variety of different sensors that are all attached to the system. The system itself is under software control, automatically collecting and moving the core samples. So let's start on the far right hand side. The first sensor that you can see here is the density sensor. What we're doing at this point is we're using a small cesium-137 source and we're firing the gamma ray through the center of the sample and collecting it on the detector underneath. This gives us essentially gamma density or attenuated density, which can be then corrected or correlated to bulk density in grams per centimeter cubed. The next sensors along this line are our P and S wave sensors that you can see here. These sensors will automatically, and you can see this in a moment, will touch down onto the surface of the sample and make surface contact. At this point, we will see on the software screen, 
on the software screen, he says. We will see the P wave coming in live. And as the P wave comes in live, that waveform, apologies, that waveform will then be collected and stored automatically inside the software. So if you did want to reprocess that waveform, you can. The next sensor along, and I should say before I move on from this sensor, that the same is true for the shear wave. So the shear waves are collected in the same way with the same software. The software will automatically pick the shear wave and then you can, as the user, then recalibrate or re-correct that as required. The next sensor along here, this white sensor, is magnetic susceptibility. This is a point measurement sensor. And what we're doing here is creating a small magnetic field around the nose of the sensor that is then able to interact with the sample. And what we're doing is we're seeing if that field intensifies or decreases, and that gives us an idea of susceptibility. In this case, we're just doing the point or the surface susceptibility. The next sensor along is an infrared sensor. This sensor is using the, the very near infrared and the short wave infrared to measure the reflectance that's measured back through this fiber optic cable. What this sensor is measuring essentially is a spectra of reflectance between about 350 nanometers, 2,500 nanometers. We use these, these spectra to interpret them against a library or within a, uh, a PLSR model to calculate mineralogy. Here, we're looking at minerals such as the clays, the different species of clay, but also the carbonate group, sulfate group, and some also of the amphibole group if you have some of your basement reservoirs. The next sensor probably needs uh, no introduction to most people that sit on this call. This is the, uh, is the Evident Vanta. I keep saying Olympus, but the Evident Vanta. This is the M series. We do use both the M and the C series on our equipment, but most commonly we're using the M. The bigger detector and the bigger source give us much better flexibility when it comes to count times and dwell times and performance in general. You can see that the software fully interacts with the, with the Vanta, taking the measurements and then passing the data back from as those measurements are collected into the software to be stored against depth. And we'll have a look at that in, mo in a moment. The system itself comes with a little shield that comes around uh, just to protect the scatter from, uh, from the XRF gun and from the users around, but it's perfectly safe for us to operate this um, uh, on the system like this. The sensor that's typically used when we have whole core is this loop sensor that you can see here. This loop sensor is, the, is a loop magnetic susceptibility sensor. In this current mode, because I'm using two-thirds slab core, I haven't got this one turned on, but whole core I could have. And the final sensors you can see here is a ring of sodium iodine detectors that we're using for natural gamma activity. These detectors are housed around a lead line cube in order to protect against background. And what we're measuring here is total natural gamma activity as well as spectral gamma. So we actually measure the spectral response of energy against counts for us to calculate KUTH uh, measurements as well. Of course, when we're looking at core gamma, we must bear in mind the volume of the material that we're scanning and how we correlate that. So moving just a little bit further away, just so we get a bit of a far out picture, you can see that there is a push up from me that's based here. This push up is pushing the core along the, sample, along the track. And as it reaches this measurement point, the software automatically knows that it's reached its point. Sensors are lowered onto the surface of the core where required and the measurements are taken all at the same time. There are, of course, some measurements that don't require uh, surface contact, such as natural gamma and density. The other measurements that do, then it's always best in general to have a flat core surface. Although I must admit, uh, a round core surface does work uh, very well as well. And this brings me on to the next point about the, the MSCLS. All of the equipment that you can see here, although we're talking predominantly about uh, oil and gas reservoirs here, can be used in a range of different types of material. So if, for example, you had a non-consolidated sand reservoir, then you can actually log those samples when they're still within their liner. You also can use this sample on whole cores, core plugs, and one third or half, or half slab material. There is equally quite a lot of work that we do when the core is still within the liner. So there are projects that we've done previously where we have the core trapped within the aluminium liner before it's been slabbed. 
And there we will do sensors such as density and natural gamma only, waiting for the core to be slabbed, after which we can use the same system to measure the surface contact sensors. The MSCLS itself is a modular system. That means that customers can choose a base frame and have a range of choices about which sensors they would like to use. Equally, if you already have an evident banter, then of course we can integrate your own banter onto this system as well. As Michael said, we've been working with Evidence, Olympus and Innovex for over 15 years now. And we've seen a huge explosion in the use of portable XRF in core analysis systems like this. The ability for a small compact sensor to be integrated onto an automated frame alongside a range of other physical property and petrophysical measurements enables to, to create a very complete multi-sensor data set. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So I'm going to show you this screen. Hopefully you can see obviously the VWeb coming in live. But also you can see that as the data is being collected, the data is automatically presented as curves. You can see that being displayed here. We also collect the spectra from both the XRF and the spectra from the infrared sensor. And in, within the data set itself, we can actually see and plot different elements. So if we wanted to get a near real-time view of these data sets, we can do that. On the processing side, on the other side, we get the data sets that exist for both the, the petrophysical measurements. So we have density, P wave, magnetic susceptibility that's all being displayed here in a live function. Equally, we can have a look at the spectra that's being collected on the natural gamma sensors themselves as well. So you get a full live track of exact or, or live feed of exactly what's happening within the multi-sensor core logger. Now you can also see for those, and hopefully this is coming through on the screen, you can see that there's a different spacing here that's existed. So on the first core that I was scanning earlier on today, then what I've been doing is taking one point every five centimeters. And for this measurement down here, I'm doing one point every two centimeters. And that's important because the user has complete flexibility to how they want to create their data set. And this comes on to an important point of how we can do this. And I'll switch back onto the other camera. This comes back to an important point about the use of core scanning. And many different uh, conversations are had about how much data is the right amount of data. Now, in general, that really does depend on the use case. The point I'm showing here is that the user has the option to collect as many different data points as they require for their given purpose. So there's no point collecting too much. There's no point collecting too little. There is, in general, a, a process from which you can achieve your goal, your scientific objective, within the time scale that you set and what you see. As I mentioned previously, once everything has been completed, then the data can be exported back out of the system and can be plotted into any graphical interface or user interface that you have as required. Okay. So, so far I've been showing you a little bit about what's happening from the Moly Sensor Core Logger. You can see the variety of different materials that we can scan and the different modalities of what we have and what we see. The cores that you're actually looking at behind you are from the Bray field in the UKCS, and most of this is pretty massive sand. And the reason why I've chosen a two-thirds th two slabbed example to show you here today is really because this is a typical type of example that might exist, with, let's say, within a core repository. It's also an interesting example because what we're finding most commonly here is that we're able to extract these data sets for new and interesting purposes. Particularly in the UKCS, where a lot of funding into carbon capture and utilization storage is coming into the front where existing core materials are being reanalyzed using techniques like what I'm showing you here today to find new and interesting features that exist in the core and the reservoirs. Most particularly, we should consider of what is happening um, in the reservoir if we pump in CO2 and also what could be happening in the seal if, of course, that is cored. Okay. Hopefully that's giving you a really good overview of what's possible from the multi-sensor core logger. And within 10 or 15 minutes, so gives you an idea of a demonstration and some actual equipment running live. Please do ask as many questions as, as you wish, uh, and I'll be happy to help you out as we go through. Okay. So far, I've explained a little bit of the value of core scanners, what the role is and why we would integrate a sensor like the portable XRF onto our systems that we have here. I've shown you how we collect the data, how that is functionally occurs, but now I want to show what we do with the data. And I've got a couple of different case studies to do that. 
So I'm going to share my screen again and go back to the PowerPoint and finish off the talk for the last 10 minutes or so, talking you through those particular points. Okay. So on your screen is the first case study that I'd like to show to you, or to you here. And this is a case study that's been uh, looked at from the Dunlin field in the UKCS. And I've explained a little bit about what that's previously for. So a little bit of the background here. We're looking mostly at the Brent group uh, formation. So this is the main oil and gas formation that's been the bedrock of UK oil and gas for the last, since the 1970s. Now, the two formations that we're looking at here are the upper nest and middle nest formation, with most of the data that we've collected around the mid nest. Now, the mid nest formation is pretty interesting because it's the reservoir block between the upper Brent reservoir and the lower Brent reservoir, and traditionally has been considered as a massive clay bed, which is a function of a lagoonal type restricted basin being formed where we get a lot of clay deposition, not much sand and it creates an impermeable barrier between the two, the upper and lower Brent reservoir. This Dunlin core, which unfortunately was a dry reservoir because they think the oil moved off to a different part of Dunlin, but it does have some really excellent stratigraphy that showcases um, uh, this feature, or these sets of formations really rather nicely. So let's have a look at this plot in a little bit of detail. And I wanna show, uh, hopefully, So if we have a look at the top part of this plot in a bit of detail, we can see the first formations that we see are the heather and upper nest formations. What you're looking at in this plot is on the left-hand side, density. We've got, oh, sorry, apologies, we've got the line scan images, we have a 2D X-ray radiograph, we've got lab and MSCL density being presented, lab porosity and MSCL porosity, we've got a VP uh, from the MSCL, a MAGSUS log, the natural gamma log, resistivity on a previous sensor that we had on this sensor. We've got poor, we've got permeability measurements taken from the core plugs presented in the middle, and then the XRF data on the right-hand side. Now, for me, the XRF data in this particular case is very interesting, particularly the potassium curve. You can see that this is quite an arcosic rich sandstone. It has a lot of potassium that exists in here. This is really interesting. The upper nest formations are traditionally thought of having a very strong terrigenous influx, in particularly in this part where you get a lot of terrigenous input that's coming through, and you see this really, really well within the XRF data. It supports this regional conclusion and gives a lot of uh, understanding of what's happening uh, regionally. Equally, you will see that the, the link between, in this upper reservoir, the link between the potassium and the, the permeability measurements is really rather striking. Where you get drops in potassium and increases in aluminium, that really shows where the clays or these very small amounts of clay are coming in and causing these little baffles that happen within the upper nest reservoirs. And you can see this really excellently within the potassium curves. So where we get lots of potassium, we have the clean sand reservoirs that are occurring here. And, and that is shown really nicely against the permeability data. Equally, we can see some other nice trends that are happening with porosity as we move further down. And I'll explain that in a moment. As we move down the log, we enter into the middle nest formation, and we're gonna spend quite a bit of time looking at this middle box called B, uh, labeled B here, which is the boundary between the, the upper and the mid nest. Notice how the potassium drops really rather dr dramatically as we enter into the middle nest formation. And importantly also, we see big rises in iron and sulfur, which are these the um, ready rust colored and orange colors that you see on the XRF on the far right hand side of the plot. These two parts combined with what we've done with the hyperspectral show the influx of clay is what's happening, but the sulfur and the iron content for me really give the game away for that restrictive back basin that we see. Again, it's really showcasing what's happening, but there's some other interesting features that I'd like to show you here. Notice how there is a small uh, change that's happening right up the top um, of the nest where we get this uh, clean sand that's starting to occur, and then the sulfur that's occurring further up um, in the sequence along with the titanium. This is showing that this basin, this restricted basin, wasn't completely restricted in the, in the very end parts of its lifetime. We were getting some breaches that are occurring within this restricted basin, probably from uh, overlapping uh, uh, waves and material coming in. 
and that has having material impact on the permeability, as you can see on the curves, on the middle part of the curves. Now, I'm going to move on to the next part because this gives us, these XRF data tell us so much about what's happening within these formations and particularly how we can use these information to guide our interpretation of lithology. So what you're looking at here is an extract of that B section that I showed you previously. We're looking mostly at that transition between upper nest and middle nest formation. And you can see this change in the potassium curve uh, further on. Now, what you will notice here is just from the basic principles of looking at these logs, you can see the really good agreement between the lab data from the density, the, uh, the MSCL, dens uh, MSCL density, and also in this plot, I've added on the wireline log data as well. So the wireline log data is represented by the dot dash lines. You can see the much lower resolution down hole and the, uh, the point plus solid lines are the MSCL data at the higher resolution. Really good agreement between the two data sets. On the right hand side of the plot, I'd just like to showcase to you there the hyperspectral data. That's the total claim maps being showcased. And then on the right hand side, that XRF data, like we've just discussed, notice the really strong connections between aluminium, titanium, iron and sulfur with the increase in clay content. It's a really very obvious trend of what's going on here. And again, that has big environmental conditions of what we see and also sediment provenance. And the reason why I say that, towards the bottom of the log, you'll notice this boundary change between the mid nest and the lower nest formation. And you can see that occurring just right here down at the bottom part of the screen. Hopefully you can see that in my cursor. You can see the rise in potassium again. But notice that the amount of potassium that sits inside this sample of these lower parts of these reservoirs is much reduced. And you can see that when we have a much wider section into the lower nest formation. The rise in potassium again is indicating that we have a terrigenous influx. In this particular case, the sediment problem is a terrigenous influx, but the terrigenous influx is much, much lower in comparison to the upper Brent reservoirs. And that again ties very, very well with the, with the genesis of the prograding fan sequence that we have in the Brent group and particularly at Dunlin. Now, as a geologist, everything I've described to you so far, you could come to the conclusion that these logs give us a really good insight and allow geologists to pick out key features. But we can go further than this. In the blue boxes on this particular example, we have taken all of these different data sets and added them to a wavelet tessellation model. This is some work that has been published uh, by colleagues and also with using June Hill's uh, data mosaic tool out of CSIRO. And we've used this, although this is a geochemical domaining, we've used exactly the same techniques, but using the petrophysics and the chemistry together. What I really like about this model is it uses a wavelet tessellation model to, um, to reduce the dimensionality of the data, and then a k-means clustering to group things together. And what you can see in the bottom right-hand part of your screen is this very, very clear, obvious data group that jumps out. We get very clear distinctions and groupings using the chemistry and the physical properties together to create, uh, and these groupings tell us something about lithology quality, pardon me. So what we can do is then we can then create, by using these multivariate analyses, we can create a pseudo log like you can see here. So the colors, the pseudo log is the output, is the clustering of these data sets together and the colors represent different rock types. Now, the reason why we've called each cluster a rock type is because essentially it's a lithology. As a geologist, you might describe a lithology as having the same chemistry, the same mineralogy, the same physical properties, the same color. And what we've done here is use a multivariant technique, an unsupervised classification of the data using the same principles, chemistry from the Vanta, mineralogy from the infrared, and physical properties from the density, et cetera, to essentially try and cluster out different rock types. And we've done that successfully here. In this particular case on this slide, I want to draw your attention to the yellow lines that I've drawn across. On the left-hand side of the plot is the geological log drawn by the geologists in 1985. This is a traditional sedimentological log. And you can see the yellow boundaries are the boundaries interpreted by the geologist. 
And you can see in general, they match really well with the rock types from the unsupervised clustering. This gives us a lot of confidence that what we're saying, what we're saying is that the, the machine and the data are seeing the same as what the geologists are seeing. Excellent, but it goes further. You'll notice that we have in this particular section, we have a lot more clay than was ever originally interpreted, and that clay is interlayered, and we have this new rock type, this very iron-rich rock type, which is a, we believe is a siderite cement, which is occurring um, within this restricted lagoonal setting that was never previously described within the geological logs. So now we've interpreted something new from these data sets that wasn't previously known. And this, I should say here, has some big implications when we start to consider using these data sets for different materials, for example, like CCUS. Here we have a big permeability barrier that we didn't previously know that it could well exist within these particular formations. And so when we start to think about these new ideas and new concepts of using core in the reservoirs, then these new features could be potentially very important, both from a geological reconstruction point of view and also an economic perspective. My final case study today is to talk to you about the Pre-Salt pre Reservoir Digital Library, which we've been collecting with Solentech uh, in Brazil. And this is a very large multi-client data set that's been collected, and the Vanta played in a very, very important part in trying to understand how these reservoirs interact. The pre-salt reservoirs, as I'm sure quite a lot of you know, are some of the fastest or biggest uh, exploration areas in South America. They have some of the largest oil columns and have the highest production rates of what we see. They are very, very big reservoirs indeed, but they have their challenges geologically most notably because they're carbonate reservoirs with lots of different styles of cement. And importantly, in this particular case, some of those cements are silicious. So what we've done here is we've collected a range of different data sets and across um, 16 different wells. And most notably, this is the first time that a geochemistry data set of this magnitude actually exists on these wells at all. So in the ANP, what's been done previously, the geochemistry has never been collected. There is some mineralogical data, but not nearly as much as what we collected now. And we've done this in a range of different wells that have been uh, selected to give uh, ultimately a good cross-section of different pre-salt reservoirs of what we see. So I'd like to dive straight in, just so we've got some good time for some questions at the end. Here's a log of what we presented so far, that what we can see and this log has been generated by a visualization software created by Geotech called Atlas. On the left-hand side of the plot, now apologies for this being uh, quite uh, zoomed out, so we're just going to zoom in again just so you can see the, uh, the data sets here. So we have gamma density, as we've seen, being collected with the line scan photograph, P wave and shear wave data, mag sus, natural gamma, and on the right-hand side of things, we have the uh, mineralogy from the hyperspectral, we have hydrocarbon total being presented again by the hyperspectral. And in these two, and it's these three columns, apologies, we have the XRF data collected from the evident Vanta. What I'd like to really showcase in this example is this particular area that we see here. Now, what we do within uh, Geotech is we use a shortwave infrared camera in this particular project. And so the shortwave infrared can't see silicate or, or tectosilicate minerals. And we, as a company, have made a very strong decision to only use the shortwave infrared because we have such excellent understanding of silicates, but because we use the banter, as in XRF. So if we just show this in this example on the right-hand side, you can see that in the top part of the reservoir in the, of this section, we have a lot more hydrocarbon being seen. I should say that we are very good at sniffing, I say sniffing, but measuring hydrocarbon from archived cores using infrared. So I could believe that we are seeing hydrocarbon here. And you can notice that actually the hydrocarbon decreases very dramatically where silica rises. And this is because what's happening in these reservoirs is silica is actually the evil of what we see. It's creating siliceous cements, which is causing a barrier to, or a decrease in porosity and a barrier to permeability and actually reducing the hydrocarbon content. So in this particular case, and you can see in the line scan image, you can see these silicious cements starting to come through here. Apologies, these images are a bit compressed, but we are showing hundreds of meters worth of data on one page here. There's also some, another interesting story that exists here. And the first one 
is that when you put all of these different data sets together, you get a really interesting story of stratigraphy. And again, this is important because we are using all of the data together, a multi-proxy approach towards stratigraphy. So the hydrocarbon bearing reservoir is a carbonate reservoir, it's dominated by calcite, but there are these silicious cements which are causing these uh, reductions in pore permeability of what we see. We can see the highest uh, densities, which is a pretty interesting uh, attribute of what we see, and we see the highest velocities. And as we move into the more clay dominated um, uh, distributions down at the bottom, you can see the instant change in chemistry that is occurring. And you can see the instant change in mineralogy, but most notably in the chemistry, and that affects the physical properties of the data sets. And this, in my opinion, is the beauty of using multi sensor core analysis equipment and when it is automated onto a system like the MSCL. Because you have the, now the confidence to make judgments because we have multiple changes occurring from multiple different techniques that all use different physics to come to that conclusion. Where one technique might suffer, another will increase. When you have everything together, it gives you good confidence of what you know is occurring here. What's really interesting, again, you can see the clay, and that has an immediate distribution effect on the distribution of hydrocarbon. And not only that, but unlike what has traditionally been seen, this formation can have a separate subdivision within it, again, as a result of the changing in the chemistry, which is most notable. So what's been traditionally described as basically one unit, one formation overlying the other, can now be described as the same, but the formation underneath has two separate fasces that have chemical and physical property differences, and importantly, also changes in the distributions of hydrocarbon. We are now learning more about pre-salt reservoirs thanks to this multi-sensor data set together. I want to show you an example, the last example of this, of this presentation, really to showcase how important this is. In the Baravela formation, we have uh, a lot of magnesium rich clays, a very unusual clays. The formation itself is a more like lacustrine style environment, and it has these really, really strange clay minerals that are occurring, like sepulite, for example, that's occurring. And that does have very strong effects to reservoir, um, reservoir quality and also effects in the distribution of hydrocarbon. And this is where the light energy performance of Avanta really does shine because the magnesium content you really can believe is what's happening here, as well as, of course, differentiate, differentiating calcite and dolomite, but can give indications in this particular example where we see magnesium rich clays. And I think this is where it's been really uh, very interesting for us. And just to show you here, the magnesium is actually the orange in this particular plot. So we can see these rises and changes in magnesium rich clays. Apologies, I've zoomed out del quite deliberately here to show you the bigger scale picture. Because right underneath, as we see the gap between the, between the two cores, we see the Itapema formation. And in this formation, we see these nice clean carbonates and notice the change in the magnesium content that's being generated here. Notice the change of what's happening between the clay mineralogies and the chemistry. In both these examples and in the last 40 minutes, I hope I've given you a good indication of how we can use these data sets and a couple of examples of stratigraphic purposes. Of course, there are lots of different ways to analyze the chemistry. We could use a principal component analysis. We can do some traditional ratios to look at lithology, for example, silica over aluminium, silica aluminium over calcium, et cetera. We could also look at rubidium contents for terrigenous influx. And we can plot that graphically. But to me, in the use of the automated scanners is producing logs that geologists like myself can instantly understand that stratigraphy that we see. And if you can imagine yourselves in the core stores now where you have your core presented on a table in front of you, how, it, how valuable these logs could be in understanding the changes that you cannot discern from your own eyes. And this is how geologists are using data sets like this every single day, both from the service labs and the oil and gas majors from our different customers. And I want to finish on, on that point. So if I say that to you, I, the question I would say is, why aren't, why aren't you not scanning core? And that was a question that one of our uh, long-term customers is now um, trying to quantify about why this is so valuable to them. This is the Patronus My Core 360 project. You can look this up online. Uh, Geotech have installed an 80-foot laboratory 
with an MSCLS, like you can see behind me. In fact, it's set up almost exactly like you've got behind me here. With a Olympus uh, or Evident Banter attached onto the uh, attached onto the arm, an X-ray CT system, like you can see in the background, collecting 150 micron CT and a hyperspectral camera, operated in one continuous flow. So the cores come in one side of the lab and they go out the other side, fully digitized. Patronus have quantified that there, as a result of these data sets being digitized, there is an 80% reduction in data analysis duration. 80% they have saved 80% time by having digital data at their fingertips. So they don't have to go around and asking for data and getting it out of files. It's there instantaneously. Chemistry right to them, right to their site. I remember talking to one of their carbonate geologists and they were saying, are you actually telling me that I have a full log of magnesium calcium ratios in my carbonate reservoir that I can look at? I said, yes, you do, every five centimeters. So the moon. But more importantly, from an economic standpoint, in the recent NPM bidding round in Malaysia this year, as a result of these data sets, as well as others being presented to the investors, there was a 30% increase in investor participation in that bidding round. So the access to digital data gave investors much more confidence in what was trying to be, in what these blocks were licensing or their license blocks were. And the confidence increases the amount of participation that they see, increases the amount of understanding to allow investors to get confidence to apply those bidding rounds of what they see. It's been an enormous success, and you can see some of the team from both Petronas and Geotech immensely proud of what they're all doing out in Malaysia at the moment. And as I say, we are, um, we're about two thirds of the way through from the 25 kilometers worth of scanning uh, with XRF and others that we're doing as part of that program as well. I've been talking now for the best part of 45 minutes. I thank you so much for your attention and your listening. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so you you can get the full uh, view of what we have. I welcome any questions. Thanks very much for your participation today. Thank you, James. Uh, that was very, uh, very stimulating uh, discussion, particularly those case studies there uh, at the end. Uh, we have quite a few questions come in, um, so uh, I'll I'll start pitching them here to you. I mean, maybe start with a, an easy one here. You you mentioned that you could adjust the dwell time on on the XRF instrument, but just from your experience, what's the typical or most common sort of throughput rate uh, in your systems when you stack up these scanners, you know, meet, meters per whatever yeah. time, time thing? Typically, if we stack everything up with X-ray, so the, let's take the Malaysia project for the moment, they typically do about three and a half meters an hour, typically, and that's everything. So that's the XRF, um, the density, the petrophysics, the CT, and the hyperspectral, everything in one go, it's about three and a half uh, meters an hour. And that's a, a point every five centimeters that we typically do uh, for those cases. That's a typical part. Dwell times from memory are about 30 seconds from on the banter. We see that gives us pretty good results of what we see because we get such good contact with the surface of the sample. Okay, great. That actually is a, you mentioned contact with the surface. We did have a question here about uh, the impact on data quality when you're working for, for all the sensors that you here have on your multi-sensor core logger, what's the impact on data quality uh, when you use fresh uh, whole core unslabbed versus slabbed core like you have here in your, your demonstration? Okay, so uh, it's very, very sensor dependent, okay, because of course the physics of everything that we do is, is different for each sensor. Um, so if I take, if I just bulk things together as surface contact sensors, so things that must touch the surface of the sample, like the infrared, the XRF, the point magsas, then in general, all of those snout designs, the actual contact are flat, and they work best if you think the very best data quality is always on a flat surface. And I'm sure, Michael, you know that even you do the part, if you take it out of the film and put on that crop, then it's different. So that's all because of the physics that you see. However, what I would say is that my own experience and the experience of Geotech using whole round surfaces using the Vanta and the X-Ray is it's extremely good. And although, yes, I, I would say always that there is a reduction in data quality, it's still excellent. And obviously the bigger the core, so in oil and gas, you have the extra advantage of a typical four inch or five and a quarter inch round surface. As far as the Vanta concerns, it's, it's almost flat. Obviously, the, the smaller the diameter, the bigger the uh, gap between the, the area of illuminate, the center head and the surface, and therefore you get a bigger reduction in data quality, as in a lower signal to noise. 
In those cases, I would typically up the dwell time just to make sure you get the counts a better signal. So in general, then the flat surfaces work always work better for surface contact, but in, we get really good results uh, even on uh, round surfaces. Okay, now let's take a step back and we talk about some of the more volume type measurements of what we have. Things like natural gamma, density, uh, and P wave, if we're doing it through the part. Those will always be better when you have more material. So that's why the two thirds slab is such a really excellent case here because we have the surface and lots of volume for the density. So you get the best of both worlds practically. But always whole core will typically be better for your more volume based measurements like density and natural gamma because you've just got so much more material to affect the measurement than what you see. Um, so that being said, we do get really great data on slab core and everything else, but I suppose the technical and strict physics-based answer is, as I've just said it, but in general, we can do that. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, several of these sensors I don't have any expertise in, but like you pointed out for the XRF, our, our scan size is about uh, 10 millimeters, one centimeter. So the curvature is, is uh, it's relatively flat over a one, one centimeter in, in most cases. Yeah. So I, 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 would, I would expect you'd see it more in your lighter elements, your magnesium, aluminum, silicon, that effect than in your, your things like your iron, titanium, molybdenum, uranium, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, you get you get a, a, a drop in performance where you see that because you get the attenuation in the air path that basically exists to that particular point. Um, but as I say, it's still it's still in the in the oil and gas side, the round is so it's such a big core uh, that you don't tend to see as much of a difference as you were if you were comparing like a BQ whole core in the mining industry versus a slab surface. It'd be a big a much bigger difference at that point. Yeah. That raises a good question. What's your what's your size diameter range that your system can accommodate for for core? Yeah, most typically. So the 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 specs would say uh, five centimeters to fifteen centimeters. Um, we have done plugs at two and a half centimeters and below. You just need to slightly to think slightly about the setup of what you use. Um, so we have done some pretty small things, and we are doing some really big things as well at the same time. So, um, which are getting up to the six inch uh, size diameter with some of the old school oil and gas wells. Um, but we can't really go any bigger than that from what we see. Yeah, I was going to translate for our, our, uh, our, our US uh, audience, right? About, about two, two and a half uh, centimeters, about one inch to six inch there, right? Yeah, so you've got about a one inch to six inch. So, a one inch core plug is, is probably about the limit of what I would go to. Um, Purely, again, you've got to think of the geometry of the sensors that we have. So we have a slightly different setup, but we've run, inch, we've run you know, two and a half inch plugs or three inch plugs, for example, and they, they work pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, there was a question here carrying on with the sort of surface contact question about uh, running core that's covered with plastic. Um, you know, sometimes yeah. the core is covered with plastic. What kind of a, you know, can you talk about the impact for your sensors and whether that's viable? Okay, well, yeah, I mean, if it's if it's thick plastic, then the only thing you measure is the plastic. Um, so, but there are cases where, uh, for example, in the, um, where you have um, wet cores, for example, that, that are saturated, an unconsolidated sand, for example, that's saturated with oil, then you can use proline film or, you know, ultra thin four or five micron film to protect the, the sensor snout um, and that works pretty well for XRF. It's not that great for the uh, ASD because, again, the proline gets a big response uh, or the infrared, sorry, the infrared signal doesn't work that well. But for the XRF, it actually does work pretty well. And that's very common when we do the paleoclimate industry, for example, where they'll actually use a film to protect the snout of the, of the banter um, uh, from getting clogged up from the outside. So that works well and it doesn't affect MagSus either. So, that does, that's a pretty effective use of plastic. But of course, if you have a thick plastic liner that the core's held in, then you'll only measure the plastic. Great, great. Yeah, and there, there are next questions, maybe uh, I'll take, someone asked about what, what elements and how many elements we could get with the, with the XRF. So typically we're, we're do about 40 elements uh, standard. Um, and that includes uh, your, your sort of earth abundant elements like your aluminum, your silicon, your calcium, uh, even titanium and iron, and uh, as 
as James mentioned, all the way down to magnesium uh, on the on the periodic table. But that includes trace components as well, uh, molybdenum, uh, vanadium, barium, cesium, uh, all of those trace pathfinder elements that might be um, uh, indicative as well. Could you mention a little bit, James, that you, in your examples, you were showing a lot of iron and sulfur and titanium, and as I take, they were common for you for these case studies, but you can toggle, I assume, in your software, which which elements you display and all of those are available to the user? Yeah, yeah, let me, let me show you here. Um, uh, so if we get up, uh, hopefully you can see uh, up here. So for example, in the software, uh, select elements to plot. And then up here, we have a full list of the elements that come out of the Ranta. So we can select any one of the elements that we want to. Uh, let's I put in rubidium, we can put in strontium, let's say or zirconium, apply, and then they'll appear on the plot on the right-hand side. So all of the elements that are given out, which is really nice zirconium changes happening, you can see in this section of core. And this is quite interesting because this core is pretty massive, right? There's not a lot going on in here. So that's telling you that there are some changes in zirconium that's actually uh, happening within, your, within this sample that could be pretty interesting for those that are interested here. So yeah, we can we can do any of this. Um, we can do any of uh, the elements that come out of the Vanta, and if we had three B mode enacted, then we can plot those as well. Right. So this uh, um, for the, the for the individual asked a question. Uh, this is from PPM level, single digit PPM levels, like on your zirconium, molybdenum, those sorts of things, uh, uranium, thorium, all the way up to uh, percent level, fifty percent quartz, sixty, seventy percent quartz. Um, can handle that from PPM to percent level range for typically 40 to 45 elements standard, but we can, these calibrations are adjustable to if there's some exotic element that you're chasing in your, in your core. Alrighty, I don't see any other questions. Oh, one just popped up. Um, what is the significant difference between the MSCL XYZ core workstation and this Vanta? Uh, maybe you can. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, so um, the XYZ system essentially doesn't, uh, the first one is it doesn't have all the sensors I've shown you here today. So the XYZ is only for surface contact sensors and imaging. Okay, and you can use the Vanta um, on the XYZ uh, as well as other types of surface contact sensor as necessary. Um, so the XYZ obviously is a bit bigger, so you can load in multiple cores at once. So you can have up to seven one and a half meter long cores loaded into the system at one time. And you can integrate the Vanta directly on one system with sensors like hyperspectral cameras, visible UV cameras, um, uh, color spectrophotometers, mineralogy points, MagSAS. And then essentially it's you close the lid and walk away and you can let it run overnight. But this system that you've got behind me is, is dedicated towards the more Vanta, having the Vanta installed alongside the other let's say petrophysical style measurements, BP, BS, natural gamma, density, et cetera. Um, so the main difference is different sensor options. And instead of moving core and static sensors, it's moving sensors and static core. Great, thank you. Um, we had another question come in here about the XRF specifically. So I'll take this question about, uh, about accuracy. And uh, the instrument will come calibrated, the XRF instrument will come calibrated for, against a large suite of geological reference samples. So your accuracy uh, is very, very good out of the box uh, with very, very tight precision. We typically expect um, better than five relative percent um, accuracy out of the box with, with the calibration. And of course you can do any kind of post-processing information that you want. And that's again from single digit PPM range up, up up to percent level. Uh, but I also think, and James, you can tag on here, uh, one of the takeaways from I see from your data set is that more than the, the absolute value itself is these major trends that you see changing the, uh, in the chemostratigraphy and the geology there. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely, Michael. That, that's where, that's, you know, the absolute values are really interesting um, for specific points, um, but is these, is these relationship changes that are most interesting from a stratigraphic perspective, and how those changes are relate to other types of sensor that we have on the model sensor core logger. Uh, for example, you know the changes in density with chemistry, the changes which has an impact on porosity in the case of oil and gas, 
or the changes in uh, chemistry with permeability and lab-based measurements. So that really gives you an, an indication of, well, what is happening from a depositional cycle that's affecting my uh, real-world case study of my application, in this case, permeability. Yeah. Great, great. Okay. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This was a very stimulating uh, conversation uh, and case study presentation here. A recording of this video will be uh, available. You should get an email in about an hour uh, giving you access to this recording. Maybe James just mentioned quickly how they can find uh, Geotech on the web and, and, it, and maybe your, your email address. We'll include those in the follow-up email, but where, where can they find out more about you? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, everybody, for, for being part of this today. So uh, you can find geotech at uh, geotech.co.uk. Uh, if you're based in South America, you can get a hold of our uh, Brazilian uh, office based in Rio de Janeiro, salesbrazil at geotech.co.uk, or you can sales at geotech.co.uk for the global uh, parts of where you have as well. Um, we have offices in the US uh, as well as in the Far East. So we look forward to uh, hearing from anybody. And if you do want to see some more case studies, please do follow us on LinkedIn, uh, where you can find the case studies um, and uh, or on our website for the more longer sort of blog style studies as well. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, I'm great. And you, you can find us at Evidence Scientific and uh, or search for the Vanta online, and we'd be happy to hear from you as well. So thank you, folks. Have a good, good morning, good afternoon, good day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.